Hey, um, last week, we started talking a bit about some of the anxiety, some of the weirdness that all of us are feeling in the moment, uh, looking at the world around us, the unknown things that are happening everywhere we look, looking at what, what does my future look like, what is the next couple of weeks going to look like, you know, heaven forbid you start to think about what's happening, you know, by July school holidays, who knows, right? That, that uncertainty, it creates anxiety in us, and it creates, uh, it makes us do weird things. We think weird things, we treat each other weirdly. If you've not seen that already, wow, you live in a cave, right? Everyone I've run into recently, everybody, including myself, the guy in the mirror, uh, is affected by the weirdness of the times that we're in and the challenges that come along with the unknown. What is next in my life? So last week we started talking about how does God address that need that we have to face the unknown and do it in a God-honoring way. We looked back at the beginning of the story of Joshua. So we looked at Joshua chapter one, verses one to nine. If you missed that message and you are a human being who has feelings, I encourage you to go back and watch it. Go back and hear the promise of God given to Joshua, given to the people of God, as they were facing a real unknown, the promised land. It, it sounds awesome to say, God is sending you into this promised land, but they had never been there. They'd never seen it. They didn't even really know if it existed, right? It, it just was in the future. They knew nothing about it except for the promise of God and to see what did God have to say to his people in that time of uncertainty. So if you're in that place, go back and watch. Today we're gonna to be talking about another gift of God's strength and provision for us as we face these unknown, uncertain times. And we're gonna be talking about something that needs to be protected. We're gonna be talking about what does it look like for us to protect the unity, right? The unity of the church, the unity of the family that is the church. Believe it or not, this is a source of strength to us. It is something that God has given us as a blessing. The world around us at the moment, it doesn't take a genius to know this, right? I'm not telling you something you don't know. The world around us loves division. I mean, absolutely loves it. It thrives on division. And where there is not division, it generates cause for division. Uh, the world loves to put us into smaller and smaller and smaller groups and to pit us against each other wherever possible. And, you know, that comes to us along racial lines. It comes to us from socioeconomic situations. It comes to us in all different categories of life. The world is always going to continue to try to divide and conquer, right? That's how, that's how it works. It works for people in the church. It works for people outside of the church. It's the same everywhere. People want uh, people are being forced into this place where they have to fight against division, they have to fight against being separated and segregated from one another. We know that this is not God's will for his church. We know this. How do we know that it is God's will that we should protect the unity of his family? Well, Jesus Christ himself prayed to the Heavenly Father about this gift of unity, about our calling to protect this unity that we have been given in Christ, that we would not become a people that are divided. You find this in the Gospel of John, chapter 17. So in John 17, there is a, a record of the time that Jesus was praying, facing the time of his arrest, eventual crucifixion, and then following with his resurrection. So this is a very special prayer. It's often called the priestly prayer, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Hello, fly. You just knocked my microphone off. Thank you very much. It was a big fly. All right, so in John 17, we hear this, this prayer of Jesus. Let's look at verse 28 to 33. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. 
Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the prayer that is given for you. You are included in this prayer. Okay, if you are someone who calls on Jesus Christ as the Lord, the master, the king of kings, the Lord of lords over your life, if you recognize his authority in your life, and if you recognize that you are someone who is in a need of salvation, you are a sinner, you have fallen short of God's glory, and you are in a place of struggle, and you know that you, you don't have it in yourself, and so you've called on Jesus Christ by faith, you have chosen to receive the gift of his love and his mercy shown to you on the cross of Christ, if that's who you are, then Jesus is praying for you. And he's asking and he's praying that you and I, as people who are sharing the title of being in the family of God, being part of the church, that we would be so unified that our unity would look like the unity between the Father and the Son, the Heavenly Father and the Son of God. That's an incredible amount of unity. It's still a goal for us, right? Even on our best days, that's still out there in the distance. That's something on the horizon that we're working toward. It's an excellent thing for us to be about as a people to see as our goal. But if you are someone who believes in Jesus and the Spirit of God is alive in you and you are actively in his word, then there is no doubt in your mind that what Jesus is praying for is God's will for you and for his church. That unity, complete unity, to be so unified that it resembles the unity between the indivisible Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's an incredible calling that we have. It's an awesome thing that he's given us as this goal, and the only way that we can ever possibly achieve it, the only way we could ever even get close to this kind of unity is to acknowledge the sources of disunity and to push back as best we can to push back on the influence of the world around us that seeks to make us dis, uh, I don't know the right word for disunified? Is that a word? It is now, that's what it is, it's disunified. Uh, to lack unity, let's call it that way. You know, this is the call of God over his church and none of us can deny that. If you do, you're denying the very words of Jesus that he adamantly was praying over us those who believe because of the word of the apostles, those who believe because of the sacrifice of that early church. And so for us today, we're gonna try our best to allow God through his word to help us push back, all right? To push against the, that spirit of diversity, uh, not diversity, sorry, that's not what we're trying to say. Division, there's too many D words in my head. All right, this, this spirit of division that exists in the world around us in, we're to be pushing back against that as a church today, as the family of faith. We need to recognize that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is welcome in the family, right? I want you to see this in another way. Not only do you have the words of Jesus already, but I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul taught, inspired by the Spirit, preaching to the church. You can look in Galatians chapter three. We're gonna be in Galatians 3, 26 to 29 for the rest of our time together. And here, the Apostle Paul, speaking through the inspiration of God's Spirit in him, writing to the church, he says in verse 26, so in Christ Jesus, right? So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So just prior to this teaching, there's this big discussion about what it means to be an heir, like what it means to be someone who inherits the status of being a child of God and that those who were Abraham's descendants, this is the ethnic Jewish crowd, were not the only ones that were going to be included in this promise, this gift of the future inclusion into the family of God. And so that's where this whole argument is leading. And here we have read the final conclusion on this teaching. And it begins in this passage by telling us and reminding the people of faith, the people of the church, just who you are. What is your real identity? Who are you for real? 
It says in this passage, if you look in verse 26, it says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All right, in Christ, for those who are found to be in Christ, located in Christ, not in the world, not in your flesh, if you have accepted that Jesus Christ is the Lord over your life and you have called on him by faith, you are now in Christ. His spirit is alive in you, his truth alive in you. You are in the location, this fear of Christ. For those that are found in Christ, you are, right? This is who you are, it's your truest identity. You are a child of God. You are a son or a daughter of the living God. That's who you are, All right? That's the most important thing that you need to know about yourself. Before you become a, a husband or a wife or before you're a child, before you're a parent, before you're a, a teacher or a police officer or a preacher, whatever it is that you do, your number one identifier, your number one source of identity in your life as given by God himself is that you are a child of the living God. That is your truest identity. Now that's impressive, we talk about it all the time. It shouldn't be news to you. If you've been a part of the church for a little while, you've heard us talking over and over about the need to understand your true identity in Christ, to understand what it means to be a child of God because everything else we do flows from that truth. Everything else we do flows from the fact that because of Christ, he has made us to become children of the living God. I don't become a child of God through my behavior. I am made a child of God, and therefore I want to do what God asks of me. Everything flows through the truth of who you are. But we can struggle to understand the significance of that truth. We are a visual people, right? What we, what we can't visualize, we have a hard time understanding. And so I love the fact that in this teaching, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church gives two incredible illustrations, ones that you can see on a regular basis that are easy for everybody to understand. Okay, these two illustrations, these two images are given in verse uh, 27. It says, for all of you, right, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So these two images are significant. The first is that of this idea of being immersed into Christ. And you're thinking, no, 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 Ryan, it says baptize. All right, somebody that's been in the church before, you've heard me say this. Biblical translators are lazy, right? They're, they're, they're human beings just like me. And when we see a word that seems to already have use in the populace, we just, we just take it straight across. We don't give it its proper meaning. The Greek word for to be baptized is baptizo, right? You've heard it a million times. And essentially what the translators have done have been like, yeah, yeah, oh, well, we already do baptisms. Everybody knows what that is. So we're just going to take the Greek word and put it in English for, as a one for one without giving it meaning. That's not useful, right? That's not helpful. What does it mean to be baptized? Oh, well, there's a fight, right? There's been a lot of those kind of fights throughout Christian history, a source of di division amongst people. What does it mean to be baptized? Well, the concept of baptism, the way it's used in regular language, baptizo, is the same as when you wash your coffee cup. Did you know that you, if you still wash, how many of you have to wash dishes by hand still? Good, you're the tough ones, you're gonna survive. All right, you're gonna make it to the end. Every time you take your dish and you plunge that cup under the waters, you're immersing your cup into the soap, into the water, into the cleansing waters of your sink. You're baptizing your cup. Okay, that's what the word means in a way that we can understand it. So here we're being taught that every one of us who is in Christ, who believes in Jesus, confesses him as the Lord and Savior of our lives, we are now immersed into the person of Jesus. Not just immersed into his work, not just Im immersed into the gift of his forgiveness, but we are now found in Christ. We are living in, we are located in the person of Jesus. We are baptized into Christ. Like you gotta understand that, that visual, you gotta see it, that I was once a part of the world, I was once an, addict, an addict to my flesh, I was once someone who was an enemy of God because of my sinful thinking, but because of the work of Jesus, not because of my work, but because of his work on the cross, he has made it possible for me to be included in his own 
self. I am included in Christ. And as a result, I share whatever he possesses. His righteousness is now my righteousness. Not because I've earned it or owned it, but because I belong in him. I'm located in Christ. It's a great visual. You know, it's not just about getting dunked in the, in the tank. Right? That's important. But man, I would much rather people understand that you don't belong to this world. You don't belong to your flesh. You don't belong to your parents and to your ancestry. You don't belong to all those things that the world says matter. You belong to Christ. You are in Christ. And that is eternal and that is unchanging and that is something that is a gift of grace given to you. And next, right, the next image that's given in this teaching after the immersion or baptism is the idea of being clothed, being clothed with Christ. Okay, this is not to say, this is unfortunately what a lot of people have heard over the years, that uh, I will put Jesus on when I need a Jesus fix in my life, and then I'll take Jesus off when I'm going to go out on Friday night and have a little bit, bit of a party. Okay, I'm going to put Jesus on when it's convenient, or I have a need, oh, God, help me. Hey, I'm going to play some worship music and read my Bible because, God, I'm in trouble. That's putting Jesus on. And then, okay, that, that's past. That moment is past, and now I'm going to take Jesus off and go out and live in my flesh again and satisfy my needs until I run to the cliff again. Right? If that's how you're living your life, that's a terrible roller coaster to be on. And instead, what we're being taught is that you are immersed into Christ. That's in a permanent, eternal state. You are held in the hands of Christ. John 6, Jesus said that you belong to him. You are in his hands and no one can take you out of his hand. It is eternal and permanent. But at the same time, you and I are called to take the things of Christ, the teaching of Christ, the example of Christ, the person of Jesus, and to remind ourselves that we belong to him and be clothed in the same way that we clothe ourselves every day before we go out of the house. Let's hope. Right? That's the plan. I see most of you got it right today. So I love these two images because they are a both and situation, not an either or. Often we, we, we put everything into either ors with God. What do you think I mean by that? What I, th what I mean here is that we often say, well, either, all right, either God has done all the work in you and you have been baptized into Christ and it's all God's work and therefore nothing belongs to you, or you must do the work to earn your way to God and therefore somehow achieve this gift of salvation. We say either or. But this is a both and scenario. I hope you see it this way. You're being taught in these two images that you are both included in the work of Jesus Christ as an act of grace given to you by Christ from the cross and seen in the empty tomb. You have been given his spirit. You have been given his truth. You didn't earn it. You can't do anything to pay it back. It is purely a gift. That's the gift of baptism. I am included in the gift of Christ. And, right? So it's both I am included and I am called. I am called as a child of God to wake up in the morning and put on the clothes of Christ. Put on my discipleship, put on my new mentality, live as a child of God, to wake up in the morning and say, I don't belong to yesterday, I don't belong to the world, I don't belong to this div divisive world around me, I belong to Jesus. And as such, I'm gonna get dressed and go out into the world as a disciple of Jesus today. I'm gonna be clothed and wrapped and covered in the things of Christ. It's both and, not either or. You are included in the gift of grace and the gift of his mercy and salvation. That is the work that Jesus has done for you and you are called to live out that grace day after day as a child of God. So here you have these two images right in front of you. The next part of this teaching really deals with uh, the, the, the statements that say, well, there is neither, right? There is neither this or that. This. Now, there's several of those coming up because we need to see that this new status, if you understand your place in the family of God, if you understand what it means to be a part of the things of God in this way, that your new status leads to change in the way that you think about yourself and the way that you think about the people around you, especially inside the family of God. Okay, so if you've got your, uh, your Bible, you want to look back, we're going to be in verse 28 and 29 again. It says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, 
neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. So in this passage, in this teaching, you see three old world ways of defining people, separating people, dividing people, segregating people. And these old ways of thinking are being challenged by the new way of Christ. Okay, the first of the old ways is found in verse 28 when it says there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Now, I cannot overstate the significance of that statement. I can't overstate the significance of the grace that surrounds that one statement. But I also understand that if I were ethnically Jewish, especially in the time of Christ, especially in this early days of the church, I would be in a place where this would be a difficult thing to understand and a difficult thing to embrace. Because the truth is, and you can read this all through the Old Testament, you can read it through the word of God, through the prophets, to the people. We're not not denigrating anybody. We're using the truth that God gave to the people of God through his prophets, saying that they were leaning too much on their ancestry to understand their standing before God. They were believing that because they were a part of the patriarchs, that because they were the seeds of Abraham, because they followed in this lineage that was their ancestry, their ethnicity, and their culture, because they believed they were in line with that, that would give them somehow a greater place in God's economy, a greater place in the presence of God, a greater standing with God than with all of the others. Right? You see it in just the term, there, are, there were Jews, and then there was everybody else the ethnos, the nations, the other. That's how they were thinking. You know, and because they missed out on the truth that was given to them in black and white, right in the word, as the law was being given, God makes it clear in verse, in chapter Exodus uh, 19, God makes it very clear to the people. He says, I am choosing you, not because you're good, not because you're great, not because you're special, but because you're the least. You're the weakest. You're the least deserving of everybody on the planet and I'm going to glorify myself by taking the weak and making them strong. And these these folks had lost sight of that. They lost sight of that truth and when Jesus came into their world and reminded them that you cannot come to the Father just because you are a part of Abraham's ethnicity, but that you must repent of sins and be born again of the Spirit They crucified him because this was so offensive, because it had become so ingrained in them. This idea that their standing before God was determined by their ethnicity, by their race, by their skin, in a sense, by the blood within them. Here in this teaching, the Apostle Paul, a great Jewish rabbi who totally understands exactly what he's saying, He says to the people with his greatest truth of all times, he says that in God's eyes, all are equal. Not saying all are of equal value, all are of equal need. That every one of us, every single person, no matter what your skin color, no matter what your race, no matter what your ethnicity, your background, your ancestry is, All of us are in a place of need before God because we are all sinners who have fallen short. We are all in a place where we have failed God and we need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. We are all in a place where we are equally called to repent and turn to Jesus. That's an amazing statement. It's an amazing thing for us to see that we are not like the world. The world divides by the color of your skin. The world divides us by your ancestry. The world divides you by the culture that you grew up in and puts you in different camps and pits you against each other, but not so in the family of God. In the family of God, we are equals in his eyes. Maybe we don't treat each other like equals yet. Maybe we're still working towards that. Maybe we still struggle to apply this gift of grace into the way that we treat one another, but it doesn't take away from the fact that in God's eyes, in God's eyes, we're all equal, and that no ethnicity, race, or skin color has any special standing in God's eyes. That's an awesome thing. 
that has been a part of God's word from the beginning. Think of all the times we've missed that. And here we are today, the church of Jesus Christ, being again challenged. Is this what you believe? And are you willing to be clothed with that belief in that Christ and to live out this truth? The second thing that we see is, is this invitation to be open to all is found in this calling that says there is neither slave nor free. Now, the first issue to be discussed is this idea of being a slave. Uh, in the Roman world in the first century, slavery was very common. That doesn't make it okay, nor does it make it easy to endure. People would become slaves when the Roman army would come into your town, country, or village, kill off all the fighting people, capture those who were left, and sell them into slavery in different parts of the Roman kingdom. That doesn't sound good. Uh, there's no point in there that you think that people were willing to endure those, those horrors. It was, so, it was so popular and it was so necessary that it was estimated that in your average Roman city, so the average Roman uh, actual like walled city, there would be two times as many slaves as there were freed people in the Roman cities. That's hard for us to grasp. And what was this slavery? Slavery is and was then and still is now. It is a social order, right? It's a social order that is seen as acceptable in the eyes of those who see it. Right? If you see slavery and you accept it as being allowed, it's a social order that is being pushed over and forced onto those that are included or sold off or are treated as property. And it's always from the powerful to the powerless. It's places of government, it's places of wealth that are pushing their needs, wants, and desires onto other people and treating them as not just second class, but as no class, as property, as chattel, as, as a chair. People in the Roman world in the first century didn't choose, they didn't want to be slaves. They were either made slaves, like I said, through conquest or because somebody would sell them into slavery because of the debts that their parents may have owed or perhaps a, a man would sell a woman into slavery to pay off his debts. Those that were in slavery they would have chosen another path if they were allowed. All right, let's just make that really clear. But slavery was welcomed into society. It was a part of the societal construct. It was accepted broadly and over time. So much so that those that were slaves, were, it was not legal. It wasn't allowed for them to mix with freed people. Okay, so if you were uh, a freed person and and, um, and I was a slave, we wouldn't be allowed to become friends. We wouldn't be allowed to dine together, to go places together, to be social together, unless I were working on your behalf. And the reason for that was to make sure that the social order stayed like it was, that things didn't get upturned. And then comes the church, right? And then enters into this social fabric, enters the, the call of the gospel, the work of Jesus, and it takes that social order that says that there are slaves and then there are freed people. There are powerful people and there are powerless. There are the rich and there are the poor. And in between, there should be no distance. I mean, there should be uh, no touching, no sharing, no, no collusion. And so in the, the church, you see Jesus Christ coming along and flattening those social constructs. He comes in and, and in this teaching, you hear that there is there's not Jew or Gentile, so ethnicity out the window. Right? Race is not a thing that should matter in the eyes of God. And now you're being told that the social orders, the things that are put on you by the world at large that aren't from God, those things have been flattened as well. In the church, they did the illegal thing on a regular basis. They flaunted the laws of Rome by meeting together in worship. If you are a slave and you meet with me in a place of worship, that's illegal. But yet, the people worshiped anyway. And they welcomed them as brothers and sisters into the family of God as equals in the eyes of God. Why? Because that was the teaching and message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And that was higher than any social order that was going to be pushed onto someone else. Division comes in all forms. And where it's welcomed by society, it needs to be rejected in the church. It's hard to overstate the impact uh, that this form of slavery and division had in the thinking, right, in the way that people thought about themselves, both for the freed people and for the slave. I mean, it, there's, there's a, a couple of books in the New Testament towards the end of Paul's writings, the really short ones, there's Philemon and and uh, in there, there's, they're talking about Onesimus, who was a slave, and, and the way that he's inter- interacting with the church as a leader in the church. And it's just, it was a struggle. They had a really hard time understanding how to live in a world where these social orders didn't exist inside the church, but they did exist in the world. And so there needed to be a re training, a rethinking, a, a new approach to what does it mean to be unified as the family together. In the church, the questions weren't, what's your, what's your race, what's your background, culture, are you slave or free? The question was, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And if you say, yes, Jesus is Lord, you are welcomed into the family. No division. If we lived like that today, it would still be the only place on earth where these things were flattened to the point where we are actually equals. You know, to be able to sit next to someone in a worship service that is, uh, you know, the CEO of the greatest company in Western Australia, but also to to have the person sitting on the other side of you be uh, a homeless person searching for a job and to know that in God's eyes, there's no separation between those two people. Their value is equal to Jesus. And we should treat one another accordingly. That is radical change. And we're still working on it, right? It's still something that we're asking God to help us understand and apply in our lives. Let's look at this teaching again one more time. So let's look at verse 28 and 29 again. It says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the last idea that we're gonna talk about in the neithers here is there is neither male nor female. Now in our way of thinking today, that now carries a whole new set of baggage that it didn't in their day. That's not a joke, I'm just saying it just is a different scenario. Uh, From where we are today, we don't understand it quite the way that they understood it. And the way that they were understanding this was very simple, men, had value in God's eyes and women didn't, right? That's, that's the common belief. Men would go to worship in the temple. Men would go into places and study the, the Bible together. Men would do all those things and women were excluded. If they were allowed in at all, it would always be as a second class citizen, as somebody separated off to the side, behind a barrier, behind a wall, hidden from God. Because the way that they were thinking about men and women was that men had a special standing before God while women had a uh, a lesser quality standing before God. That is the form of division that is being driven out in the church. It's being thrown out. It doesn't exist. It never existed in God's eyes and it was pushed into being and it was pushed too far and people made too much of it. And men abused this right and began to say that they, we, were in a position of authority of of special nature in God's eyes and therefore women were subject to us. This doesn't get rid of the fact that men and women are created for different purposes. We have different functions in life. I mean, just biologically, we're different. There's things I'm not gonna go into that make us different, all right? And we think differently, right, women? The guys in your life think different. Maybe sometimes not at all. (laughs) You know, we know that, right? We know that functionally speaking, yes, there are differences. And yes, there is, there are men and women in the church. Yes, that's true. Just like there were slaves and there were freed people in the church and just like there were Jews and there were Gentiles in the church. That doesn't mean that those statuses didn't exist. It just means that they don't matter to God. That in God's eyes, you are equal. 
And if we begin to treat each other in the way that God treats us, in the way that God sees us, we showed that kind of grace and mercy to each other, we wouldn't have second-class citizens in the church. We wouldn't have the special and important and the not so important. Or these people are good for this, but those people are, mm, we're not sure what they're good for. But in God's eyes, equality equals unity from his perspective. Now, there's a lot you can say on all three of these neithers, but I don't have much more time. I want to close with another question, which is that question of why does the unity of the family of faith, the unity of the church, why does it matter? Why is it worth fighting for? Why is it worth recognizing sources of disunity and pushing them away in the name of Jesus? And the answer is because our unity as a family, as the people of God, is a direct witness to an unbelieving world. I'm not making that up. We just heard that in the prayer that Jesus gave in John chapter 17. In fact, let me, let me let you hear it again, all right? So John 17, 22, Jesus prayed. He said, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. So the goal is unity, but here's the why. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. If we fall into the trap of division in the church, moving forward as we face the unknown, if we fall again into the trap of segregation in the church, what will we be doing? Number one, we'll be damaging those that we treat as second class citizens, right? Was it damaging to the Gentile, to the slave, and to the woman to be segregated, to be set apart, to be told they are less than in the eyes of God? Of course. We are damaging the reputation and the name of Jesus Christ. If we, like the mistakes of the past, go back and say that because of Jesus, we are now going to separate each other into different classes and statuses again, we do damage to the reputation of Christ. And lastly, we do damage to the message of the gospel itself. This message we are hearing today, this prayer from Jesus, is the good news. It's the good news for all of us that he wants us to be unified as the family of faith regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your status in the world around you, and regardless of whether you are a man or woman. There is nothing that separates you from the other in God's eyes. All are equal in his eyes. If his people don't behave in that way, we do damage to the gospel. These things are pretty significant. So what can we do, right? That's a big question. All right, you can hear all this stuff. What can we do to actually push back the spirit of division that exists in the world all around us today? Well, if your goal is to change the government, to change the minds and the hearts of all of the people that are powerful, that, that force some sort of social order onto others, you're gonna fail, right? We're gonna, we, we don't have that power, it's not within us. We don't have the ability to do those things. Now collectively as a whole, yeah, we can do a lot, but individually, even just as a church, that's a bit of a stretch. That's not where our most efficient use of our energy and time should be placed. The most efficient way for us, the best way for us to push back the spirit of, of division that we see in the world around us is to be a people of grace. And when we see somebody and we talk with somebody that is not the same as us, that thinks differently than us, has different opinions, different values than we do, but yet they call Jesus the Lord over their life, we show them grace. We show mercy to those who need mercy. Maybe in your mind, they're as wrong as they could possibly be on every topic they're talking about, but if they confess Christ, show them mercy. Don't throw hate at them. Don't label them as second class, as other. Don't go back and divide. And lastly, we can be a people who welcome those who are rejected. We can do that. We have a great example in the church of Jesus Christ. Those who have gone before us, who have set the standard for us, 
will be the ones we hope to walk in their steps. Whatever comes, we will not be a people divided by the sins of this world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to be people who are unified by the one banner, the one name, the one title of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. Lord, that matters more than anything else. That is the most eternal truth, the most real thing we could say. Lord, for those that are under that banner and under that umbrella of your gift of love and mercy and grace, Lord, we hear the call to treat each other with unity, with an embrace, with welcome. To not put false divisions between us, to not allow the divisions of the world to become our divisions, but instead, Lord, to listen to your work, your spirit and your truth, what you have already done and what you are seeking still to accomplish in us. Lord, the world around us needs you. They need you more than ever. They need to know you. They need to understand you. They need to embrace you as as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you, God, that you have given us, the church, you have given us the privilege, the honor, and the job of being clothed with Christ, walking as disciples, demonstrating love through the way that we treat each other. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredible gift. We ask this in your name. Amen.